podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for today's BC uh, Ideas Exchange Showcase, where we're going to be talking about workforce and resident attraction success stories across British Columbia. My name is Jessica Ritchie, and I'm with the Regional Programs and Engagement Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade, and Technology. And I'm going to be providing the technical support and moderating our Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. I'm located in Victoria, BC, on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish, uh, oh, sorry, on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, today known as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. As you know, the webinar topic today is going to be resident and workforce attraction. We have two stories coming from panelists from the Kootenays, Randy Morse and Terry Van Horn. However, through the stories, you'll hear that they both have very different socio, social economic um, areas and they are their communities have unique economic assets. Um, and as you, you hear from their stories, they have different lessons that they've learned, um, which they are gonna be sharing, as well as they'll be open for questions and some discussion at the end of the webinar. So save your questions that you might have, because we would li like to have some discussion about what's happening in other areas of, of the province and for you to be able to ask these experts on what else um, they have to share. Before we get into the webinar, I'm gonna just have a little bit of housekeeping. So um, if you're unfamiliar with this platform, hopefully this will answer some of your questions. So um, on your control panel, you'll see that you have the opportunity to call in with your computer audio. But if you are having any difficulty with the sound, you can also use your phone line. Uh, just click on the phone call button and you'll be able to, um, a phone number will pop up and you'll be able to call in with that number. If you do have any questions, like I said, just expand the question box and uh, enter your question there. We will be saving most of the questions for the end of the session, um, but that doesn't mean you, you need to ask them then. Ask them whenever they come up so you don't forget them. And uh, you will be muted, but if you do would like to be unmuted during the discussion portion of the session, use the raise your hand button on your control panel and we'll be able, to, I can, I'm able to unmute you and you can ask your question that way if you'd prefer to ask it yourself. And just a reminder, and you would have heard this at the start of the session, the session is going to be recorded and it will be posted on the BC Economic Development page on our website. You can search it at BC Ideas Exchange in the past webinars reporting section. Um, this is, uh, please feel free if you learn a lot of useful information to share this link in this YouTube video as well, and other people will be able to benefit from it too. Um, before we get into it, just a, a little bit, I wanted to share just kind of what we are looking for from this webinar for you guys, for you to be able to learn. Um, hopefully, you'll be able to describe the resident and workforce attraction strategies and how they can fit into your community's plan. You'll be able to relate to these BC-based stories um, and what they've done in terms of their workforce and resident attraction. And you'll be able to identify actions that your community may be able to take or communities that you work in or the communities that you work for, um, for residents and workforce attraction. Before I pass this over to Randy to share what he's been working on, we just like to get a general idea of why, what uh, level of uh, resident attraction and community, resident, oh, sorry, where resident attraction fits into your community's priorities and their economic development strategy. So I'm gonna just launch a quick poll and if you take a couple seconds just to um, answer the question, that would be great. So if you, how important is it? Um, high priority, medium priority, low, low priority or not a priority at this time? So I'm gonna close the poll, but what I can tell you is 70% of you found that it's a high priority for your community at this time, 25% saw it as a medium priority, and then 5% saw it as a low priority. So um, that shows the, the importance of this webinar, and hopefully you're gonna get gather some really important information here. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Randy Morse, who's coming to us from CASLO. Randy, if you'd give us an introduction to yourself in the BC Rural Centre before diving into the resident attraction campaigns that you've been a part of in Caslow, that would be great. 
Sure, terrific, Jess. Thanks very much for hosting and thank you for inviting me today. So the BC Rural Center is a nonprofit organization that's, that's been around for over 10 years and it's unique in the province in that it's the only non-governmental organization that's clearly and solely focused on issues of importance to rural British Columbians and First Nations members. We're talking about issues that range from agriculture to technology, community investment, education, healthcare, and the subject of today's webinar, um, attraction, population attraction, bringing new people, new ideas, new jobs, new creativity to rural British Columbia communities. Our offices are located in Kamloops, where our executive director, Gordon Borgstrom, is based, and here in Kaslow, uh, where I'm based. I'm the communications director for the BC Rural Center. So, uh, Jessica, I'm now looking at a very small window, and I'm not sure that I'm able to advance slides. So if you could do that for me, that would be terrific. Sorry so, that, Randy, but I'm happy. oh yeah, not a problem, not a problem. So to, to start off, um, we've talked about the BC Rural Center. One of the issues that, that we've discovered in our work with rural communities over the years and, and this is evidenced by the, the results of this quick survey that, that Jess just held, with over 75% of you saying that attracting new people to your communities is either a, a significant or at least a, a fairly important issue for you going forward. It's, it's inescapable to notice that most small communities in rural British Columbia are graying. Uh, there's an outflow of young people. It's difficult for many communities to retain their young people once, once they grad. And it's equally difficult for many communities to attract new young people, in particular young families, and most especially young families and young individuals who are entrepreneurial, who might be interested in moving to a rural place and starting a new business or enterprise. So, in the face of that, we started doing some research and we began to notice what we thought was something of a trend, and that is an, a growing interest amongst some urban creative types, millennials and slightly older than that age category, in leaving major urban centers for the, the healthier, uh, the more convivial lifestyles that they suspected rural places might offer. So we wanted to test whether or not that was an actual sociological fact. And we, we discussed various ways of doing that, ranging from the boring and the scientific to the fun and the less than scientific. And we decided to err on the latter side and launch a contest. So we came up with something called Escape the City. This was a contest that was clearly targeted at millennials with children based in metropolitan Vancouver, metropolitan Victoria, metropolitan Edmonton, and metropolitan Calgary. It was completely social media based, so the, the entirety of this initiative was focused on a campaign that zeroed in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And so even though we did target those four metropolitan areas in Western Canada, because of the nature of the web, of course, folks elsewhere also uh, came across information about the contest. The, the winners would win four nights, three days in Kowslow, where I happen to be based, which is, you'll have to take my word for it, a lovely picturesque village. You can sort of get a sense of that from the small picture you see on your screen right now in the West Kootenai, located on the shores of Kootenai Lake, one hour north of Nelson. So four nights and three days in Kowslow, completely immersed in the local culture. To win the contest, uh, entrants had to submit either a 250-odd word essay or a video explaining, trying to convince us, 
why they were interested in the possibility of moving from their respective cities to a small place like Kaslo. The finalists were then interviewed on uh, a video call like this one by myself and a committee of locals that we put together ranging from the mayor of Kaslo to young parents, grandparents, the principal of the high school here, or the school I should say here, and a couple of other interested citizens. So the result of this was actually sort of astonishing. First of all, uh, Caslow received a tremendous amount of media as a result. Um, CBC radio was all over this. Uh, major newspapers did stories. Uh, there were lots of online uh, reports about the contest, which served to really focus uh, a lot of a lot of attention on Kaslo. Uh, and as you'll hear in a bit, it also had the effect of galvanizing the community around a central question that I think is going to resonate throughout today's webinar, both in in what I am about to say and what Terry will say in a bit. And that is that it, it galvanized the community around doing an assessment of what its, its most significant assets actually were and are. So the response to the contest was, was astonishing. We received hundreds of entrants, hundreds of entrants, and our finalists uh, were whittled down to four four clusters of four families, I guess, three families and an individual, a family of seven from Edmonton, a young couple from Calgary, a family of four from Victoria, and a young woman from San Diego, California. The, uh, sorry, the slides take a little while to load here, like a long while. Here we go. So the outcomes of, of this contest were several. First of all, as I identified earlier, very importantly, this contest galvanized the community and created a sense of community connection. There was a lot of discussion leading up to launching the contest on what the contest should focus on in terms of showcasing Kaslow and his assets. Uh, we did a number of of really interesting, very easily done kinds of things, including shooting dozens and dozens of very short Instagram videos featuring Kaslovians, just 10 to 15 minute, sorry, 10 to 15 second long clips, which each of them, each of them saying something to the effect that I love Kaslo because, and then fill in the blanks. One of them, one of my personal favorites, I don't know why that slide has come up, it's very attractive, but okay. Um, was, was a guy coming out of Kootenai Lake in the winter, coming up to the camera and saying, I love Caslow because I get to walk around in my underwear. These were very popular and they were, they were widely distributed, in this case, on Instagram. Um, that, that initial identification of community strengths were, was then celebrated throughout the actual contest when, when the winners were actually in town. Um, and the winners, by the way, you see in front of you right now on the front porch of Kaslow's historic city hall, um, the young couple from Calgary flanking in the red coat and the, the parka on either side, that would be Jean-Michel and Rochelle Longval. And, and then the family from Victoria with their two school-aged kids. Um, one, of the, one of the most marked uh, wins from this contest was the fact that the, the young couple from Calgary immediately went back to their hometown, sold their home in Calgary, and returned to Caslo and bought a home. They've now had their first child and have launched a new business. The, the other outflow from the contest is that um, we, we did this completely focused on social media in part because we wanted to attract young people who were themselves adept and fluent in social media, because we knew that they would become ambassadors not only for the contest itself, but subsequently uh, ambassadors for Kaslow, and that's certainly proven to be the case. 
So we already, the, the village of Kaslo is receiving all sorts of inquiries from young people from around uh, Canada and, and across North America, curious about the possibilities of moving here triggered by this contest. Waiting for the screen to move on to Here we go, whoops, sorry, okay. So going back to one of the first things I said, uh, that is the fact that the Escape the City contest, while it's, it was a fun, media savvy, uh, seemingly sort of frivolous exercise, was rooted in some very, very important empirical uh, facts. One of them being that it's, in our experience, almost impossible for a community to successfully uh, launch a new ActDev project without first identifying what its singular unique assets are. And you're certainly going to hear that in spades in a moment from Terry talking about their experience in the trail area. So to, to, to help with that, we've, we've launched another project called First Impressions, which is a very interesting initiative that helps communities identify what their what their weaknesses are, but more importantly, what their strengths, what their singular assets are. And we've done that with a number of communities. And um, it's, it's interesting because with the assistance of the BC Rural Center, we bring together two different communities in the same region. And help them put together teams that visit their, their neighboring communities and uh, do a careful analysis of the strengths and weaknesses in their neighboring communities. Then we share the, the outcome of those surveys with each community, both online and then through face-to-face -face meetings that usually result in actually uh, some concrete action uh, with communities having now seen through fresh eyes what their strengths and weaknesses are, having a new basis upon which to say, okay, well, let's go forward and let's do X, Y, or Z. So the final thing that I'll say before handing over the reins to Terry is that another thing that we've noticed, and it's really, I suppose, the main reason why the BC Rural Center exists, is that if there's one thing that most small remote communities in British Columbia share, it's a lack of capacity. Um, what I mean by that is that sometimes, for example, tackling the fact that the community is graying, that there's an outflow of young people, or uh, the fact that there aren't enough decently paying jobs in the community now that the mill has closed or the mine has closed, whatever the case may be, the fact that there isn't uh, a critical mass of affordable, innovative housing, either rental housing for low-income earners or, or, or decent or purchase housing for young families and perhaps recently retired seniors. Tackling any one of those things can be daunting in many communities because they lack the, they lack the capacity to, in a substantive way, tackle them. The same small cluster of volunteers are running from one issue to another, sort of plugging, plugging holes in the dike, and there are lots of holes in the dike. So the BC Rural Center is able to come into a community and help, help identify all the holes and ideally help plug all of them simultaneously. And so to, to help with that kind of effort, we're doing a couple of things right now, for example, that are germane to today's webinar. One of them is that we've launched a new initiative that uh, allows us to work with communities who would like to emulate uh, on some level what we did with Kaslo and the Escape the City con contest. We can, we can be contracted and then work with communities to help them do something similar to that. And we also have a new initiative uh, that focuses on asset-based community development, or ABCD, where we can go in with some world-class consultants, including our executive director, Gordon Borgstrom, and work with the community to help them identify their singular, unique assets that then they can build a new economic development strategy on, one that recognizes that in small 
communities, everything is interrelated. It's not just about creating new jobs. There also has to be adequate housing for the people who work in those jobs. There has to be a workforce to fill those jobs. There need to be decent schools. There needs to be a whole range of amenities or attracting young creatives from major urban centers to rural places just won't happen. So on that note, I'm going to stop and uh, welcome Terry to tell us a bit about the exciting work that she and her colleagues have done in TRAIL. Sorry, Terry, you're just muted right now. Are you able to unmute yourself? I'm not able to do it for you. Oh, there all you right, go. there you go. Thanks, Randy, I really appreciate your um, presentation. It's fantastic because trail, of course, is only a couple of hours uh, uh, away from Caslow and my husband's family is from there and still there. So I, my heart is near and dear to Caslow, that's for sure. So for those of you who do not know who I am, my name is Terry Van Horn. I'm the um, Regional Economic Development Officer for the Trail Area. And uh, I talk about regional because it is um, certainly uh, a collaborative approach to uh, economic development taken with five municipalities and two regional um, districts. Uh, the municipalities are the city of Trail, the city of Rossland, the, I'm kind of trying to work the screen at the same time, sorry, my apologies. Uh, Trail, Rossland, and then the villages of Montrose, Fruitvale, Warfield, and um, the regional districts of area, Kootenai boundary of area A and area B. So I have uh, seven uh, mayors and 32 councillors as my bosses. <laughs> so at times it is um, challenging to come up with regional projects that will be able to support the entire area because every community has its own individuality. But so today I want to talk about two uh, projects, very different projects. One is actually talking about um, uh, the um, creating strategies on a local perspective and then one is creating strategies to attract economic development or workforce or business opportunities on a global scale. So the first strategy I wanted to talk about is the um, thriving communities metric and that that metric was very uh, strategic. We realized 70% of new residents that came to our area actually were visitors first. So they visited the trail area and then they came here and said, wow, it's fabulous, how can we stay? And we recognized if we created strategies around educating our local um, residents, when the visitors came here, we could share those stories with the visitors and then provide this um, you know, a common, common message to visitors about how thriving our communities actually are. And so um, every month we would publish these really great economic development metrics. And the one you see here is about the skill center having 1,100 jobs posted in the, in the region. And so everybody's like, wow, so I want to stay. There must be pretty good jobs here. So we made sure we had the graphic kind of visible on very many different mediums. We, we went and did social media stats and sites. We did local billboards. We did company newsletters. So we contacted our key companies like Tech and Atco and Fortis who have very, very um, uh, high number of employees to put it in their monthly newsletters that they send around internally to the employees. And so we kept continuously taking these metrics every month and then um, showing them in all different kinds of media to, to actually subliminally hopefully have people start seeing the same information over and over and all of a sudden they're learning these really neat stats that they could share with anybody that's come to our region. So this one here is about the job posting. We, um, and next screen please. And then we also had, um, we used the thriving communities metric to um, 
also call it maybe thriving businesses. So if there was a business doing something amazing in our area, we could also use that as a good news story. And here's when Red Mountain um, invested $30 million to build the, <clears throat> the brand new Josie Hotel. Um, <clears throat> And so we use that as a good news story. So people are all starting starting to see these um, metrics every month and every different kind of mediums and going, wow, there's a lot going on in our community. I didn't know this was happening. Did you know? And now all of a sudden they're sharing those stories and talking at the water cooler. And then people come to visit and they start telling the same stories to them. It's interesting because, you know, there was a lot of, um, discussion about how and what to be able to showcase so making sure that we stayed within you know the uh, something that was tangible that we could actually measure or and track and and actually get qualifications of so um, it, it's a another really great way to you know collect metrics from economic development uh, perspective and any of you who are attending today that um, you know, are always asked about what what are the metrics in your economy, what's happening in your economy, you know, um, this is a really great way to collect that information and on top of it be able to um, advertise that. I did want to make reference to about the uh, graphics in this and you'll see our area is very, um, very uh, well known for uh, tech metals, the, it's a, the world's largest integrated lead zinc smelter and so you can see that the, we're right on the Columbia River and it's uh, you see the tech stacks and then we have a famous three bridge and then you have the beautiful um, red mountain attached to that so making sure you pick a theme that's uh, real to your own your own communities and unique um, and making sure when you're doing it on a regional perspective trying to keep all of your partners happy at the same time next slide please um, and so one of the th ways we did was that we actually applied for the VCEDA Marketing Award and we actually created our own <laughs> Thriving Communities metric mock-up for the award application, which we won. We were pretty happy about it. But this is a demonstration about how to be able to use it in different ways as well as using it to sell, tell good news stories, using it to tell good business stories, and then, for example, using it to tell that we won the BCDA award. So I have to admit that was a bit of a joke when, um, when they got the application and they saw that we had created our own metric for it. They said that was one of the most innovative ways that any applicant had done for them. Next slide, please. Um, so a couple of lessons learned about this. This is kind of the examples of some of the billboards and these billboards were locally and it was specifically very targeted locally. Again, another medium for our residents to be able to have some of these um, metrics firsthand so that they can share. And um, although it's very time consuming to collect the information, again, go, going back to that it is a really great way to be able to um, use that for reporting efforts as well in the future. It is expensive for a local market, so sometimes justifying the expense to your stakeholders for trying to educate the locals was uh, sometimes uh, difficult to justify, but it did have success. Um, it really increased the visibility of the actual LCIC office, which this um, initiative started when we were first undertaking initiatives for the Economic Development Office. So it actually uh, subliminally or in an inadvertently did increase our inquiries and they doubled within a year from when we started posting these metrics and the, and the residents started to understand that we, what some of the activities that we were trying to um, undertake. So it was very successful. Now I wanted to talk about, um, so this was more of a local perspective on how to attract, um, get get the locals excited so that when people are coming to our community they can share that and then inadvertently attract new people to our, our region. The next, um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was, um, and this is some, um, <clears throat> a, uh, testimonial from our one of our mayors and they found it very successful and you're, you'll get the slides so you be, you can read through that. And now the next um, strategy I want to talk about is the Metal Tech Alley strategy. So I want to, I'm sure, next slide please, I'm sure 
some of you have heard about uh, the Metal Tech Alley. The Metal Tech Alley is a marketing strategy for a region, and this was um, a very strategic clustered approach to economic development to basically take all of our assets and all of our communities and put it into one sexy brand that we could all talk to. The beautiful thing is, is that as a rural community and, um, you know, most of you will relate to this, that technology has changed the landscape of how we do business how all of us do business, whether it's a resource-based economy, a home-based business, whether it's healthcare, business is changing through technology. So I felt the, the Metal Tech Alley was taking the, our expertise in the metallurgical landscape and the technology, how it's changing all business and creating this um, sexy name called Metal Tech Alley, which is trademarked now. And it's it tells you very quickly that it has something to do with metallurgical or metals and something to do with technology. So if anybody knows where Trail is, we're home to the smelter. I talked about that earlier. That is, um, that is what we are known for. And so instead of trying to pretend to be something we are not, and this was not an easy sell to um, our stakeholders because they wanted you know, they wanted to say, well, we're about tourism, we're in the Kootenays, and, you know, what about tourism? And I kept saying, that's great, that's fabulous, but that's not a different story. And we really quickly realized that unless you tell a different story, you get lost in the, the marketing, you know, social media, the whole marketing aspect of economic development. And Metal Tech Alley really was a different way to tell the story. So by taking our expertise in the metallurgical and telling a different story that's positive and um, and informative, and then being able to attract people, like-minded people, that to understand that this expertise is already here. And so, one of the things I wanted to be very clear about is, even though we're a regional economic development office, you'll see that Trail BC is our locator on our brand, and that was not an easy sell. Our other communities are like, well, we want to be on the label and we want to be there. And and it was a, a very strategic decision to ensure that trail is already on the map. People will be able to find trail and they'll specifically be able to um, understand the metals attachment to trail. And so we needed to use that as our locator so that it already has created an audience instead of trying to um, you know, water down the message that we were trying to make. And so <clears throat> we we use trail as a locator, but that by no means uh, means that we are not also including all of our surrounding communities. The beautiful thing that all of our region is touched by the metals in the technology sector. So that was a really um, good way to sell that without the metals in the technology, none of our communities are strong. I really want to um, emphasize that finding your own identity, finding what you guys do good in your own community is imperative to sell the brand or sell the project or sell the, um, <clears throat> the strategy. Because without doing that, then you won't get buy-in and then it's really hard to sell anything. Next slide, please. Um, I wanted to talk about, uh, we have a focus of, uh, those of you who don't know, we are home to one of the world's only lithium ion battery recycling facility. And with electric cars um, industry going to be continuously advancing technologies, uh, we're situated to be a, a, a global player in the recycling economy in this region. And we already are, we do all Tesla's recycling, we do all electric batteries get recycled here in trail. So to, to, to grow that infrastructure and to be able to market that and tell that story that people don't know this kind of global reach is actually happening right here in our, in our southeastern part of British Columbia that people just don't even, are not even aware. And of course, again, we talked about technology and innovation. We're home to Western Canada's first innovation 4.0 industry hub, which um, is changing technology and industry globally at a rapid pace and we're we're doing it here. These things we're doing here. And one of the interesting part was is that when we started identifying our assets, 
um, we realized that we have one of Western Canada's largest service supply chain for industrial companies. We and it kind of overlooked us, but we realized we had every engineering, global engineering firm has a satellite office or an actual physical location and trail. That's an incredible asset to the region to support that kind of industry. And so that was actually um, wasn't origi originally identified and came out of the stakeholder engagements. So it makes us unique, it makes us different, and we need to celebrate it and not try to hide behind it because it's industry. There's a way to make industry um, um, attractive and environmentally. You know, tech is a Fortune 100 environmental company. The, the environmental standards that are coming out of our region it, our global leaders telling that story is a way to um, engage a whole new audience that we haven't been able to engage in the past. So next slide, I just I don't want to go into detail about this uh, too too much, but the thought process was that LCIC was in the middle, and when we started identifying our assets, we started to realize that our companies all had the same target market for the workforce, and this really all started when we did all this work, stakeholder work, to listen to our businesses about, Terry, we need workforce. We're struggling to have skilled workforce. We are very, very struggling to um, find talent. How can you help us? And so we also have 100 acres of industrial land, which is so unique in the province that's, that's open to industrial investment and open to um, processes that most of British Columbia um, doesn't even um, consider or don't, doesn't have expertise in. So having those 100 industri acres of 100, 100 acres is also an asset. And we started realizing that all these companies had the same target market. They had the same, the same wants and needs. They needed engineers, they needed technologies, they needed very high skilled um, workforce. And I said, you know what, what if I, I went to the business community and I said, if, and there, and, Sorry, I kind of blew through that, but they had the same needs and they weren't doing anything about it because they didn't really have the budget to do it. And I said, you know what, if you each gave us, the LCIC, a little bit of money, we'll take that money and we'll market the region as a whole. Who cares if we attract an engineering student that goes to tech or an engineering professional that goes to AMEC or, or would now, or an engineering student that went to um, Austin Engineering? We still attracted an engineering person to come to our region and them knowing that there are other options is also very attractive so that they're not thinking gosh there's only one job for me in this area and we recognize that if we marketed our area as a whole it didn't matter which company these people came to work for they're coming to our region they're bringing highly skilled people with them and chances are that they are also going to be needing um, highly skilled jobs and then we all become stronger together instead of an individual company getting the workforce they need and then not caring about what the rest of the region is doing and so by doing this on a clustered approach I went to the businesses and they gave me money they gave me four hundred thousand dollars I collect locally for um, all through the region for business support and I took that money and I went to the rural dividend fund and um, leveraged that into a million dollar project to market the metal tech alley strategies and to attract workforce to do workforce development and workforce attraction as well as business attraction and so these companies um, they are completely bought in they were partners in the project and it has been very successful next slide please I can go into a whole bunch of details about you know, if anybody ever wants to talk in detail about the actual strategies, but I wanted to just say that this was a long-term plan. To be very frank, <clears throat> it took us four years of stakeholder engage engagement, foreign direct investment strategies, business retention and expansion studies. All of that work was happening in the background for the last four years before we ever got to Metal Tech Alley. And so to be patient and make sure that this is a long-term play and all of those other activities had to take place in the background before we could truly identify what our assets were and before we could truly get buy-in from everybody. They were part of the process all the way through. And so to be very clear that, um, Having all of those pieces in place 
allowed us the um, you know the data and the background to, to validate what was needed in the area it wasn't easy and to be very clear we had a lot of times our stakeholders were knocking on the door going what are you guys doing we haven't seen anything you know it's not sexy it's not visible in the community because we were doing it behind the scenes all the studies and the stakeholder work and then when we rolled metal tech alley out three years ago everybody was like oh i get it now so it's been almost three years since we've rolled it out. We've raised um, $2 million in the last three years. It's actually for four years. So by the end of next year, it'll be $2 million. Um, our inquiries have doubled in the past year. We're up to, you know, we started with, a, you know, single double digits and we're up to thousands of inquiries that we're handling a year. It's, it's exhausting, but it's amazing. We've got 19 new jobs locally created, nine new companies have relocated to the um, region. We have $5 million to increase revenues for the region. And not only is that for the actual businesses that are coming into the region, but it's also for this other, the service industries now had their workforce increase because the accountants and lawyers and those kind of professional services to support the new business that's been attracted, their revenues are going up. So it's kind of this snowball effect of more, more business and more needs being um, needed. Um, and the visibility from the provincial scale and the national scale has been amazing. I've had um, a lot of uh, opportunity to speak on this process and speak about the validity of a clustered approach to economic development. The partnerships with the private sector is really, really important to drive strategies like that. And then, of course, um, having provincial support, and it's been amazing. The Rural Dividend Fund has been instrumental in um in the success of metal tech alley i cannot say enough about that uh the belief they had in the this project and the belief in the the value of uh supporting it could uh bring to our community we um we've had many ministerial visits since then going oh my goodness i had no idea this was going on in our very own backyard how can we help support you and that really was the key that targeting our government officials to know about it was a very strategic we purposely were reaching out to every ministry saying hey did you know so that they can share our story the more we can educate um uh our leaders in our province in our country to talk about this story the easier it is to spread the, the, the message. So um, that was very strategic by partnering with our provincial ministries. We have I4C Innovation Center. I talked about the Industry 4.0 Innovation Hub. They're actually part of the Digital Supercluster, one of the only rural um, businesses that are part of the BC Dig Digital, Digital Supercluster. And we opened, we won a couple of awards recently this year about the BC EDA Community Impact Award and the Open for Business Award. And finally, some lessons learned. Next slide, please. It doesn't happen overnight. I talked about it taking four years. Collaboration was key, especially with the private sector, as well as, of course, your um, support organizations. Educating the businesses and the partners and the local leaders to tell the story is imperative because we don't have the money to, you know, to be able to do a full-blown marketing campaign. It, it, you know, and so to be able to tell people as much as possible and provide them with the collateral they need to tell the story for us. Big problem, sustainability. <laughs> I can't see the Rural Dividend Fund, you know, sponsoring this forever and supporting this forever. So we better come up with a sustainability plan. That's part of our Rural Dividend Fund this year and the beginning of next year is to find a way to keep a value proposition for all of our businesses to buy in, to understand that even if this is tied to the metals and technology sector, that all businesses are actually going to, you know, um, improve and all boats flow and creating a value proposition that they are willing to pay into to continue this momentum will be imperative. Interesting, my friend told me this and I didn't believe her, but she's my colleague and she helped me through this process in the last four or five years. And she said, Terry, if you build it, they will come. If it's sexy and interested and different, they will come and they have come. Be entrepreneurial and passionate and don't be afraid. If you, if something doesn't go the way you want, make sure you pivot, no matter how good you think it is and go on and 
and and do something different but be passionate about it and make sure that you um you are open and share that and people will want to be part of it and exactly like randy talked about at the end of his presentation was about with success comes other economic development issues to consider housing infrastructure all those kinds of assets um, that um, make make a new person new resident new business strong and healthy you have to have all those other infrastructure in place too to support that and um, so we are realizing now that we have to basically go back and rethink about other infrastructure, economic development infrastructure to support this growth. With that, I'm happy to um, answer questions and um, talk more in more detail, but um, I'll turn it back over to Jessica now and um, I await for questions. Thank you so much for that, um, Terry and Randy both. If anyone has any questions now for our panelists, um, please feel free to use your control panel to put up your hand, or if you'd like to um, type up your question into your question panel. Um, I know I have one question for you both. Um, you've both been successful and you both talked about the need to um, plan for your successes. Um, what's the kind of one thing that you wish you had known about before you started your campaign? <laughs> I wish I would have known um, how long of a process was. You know, it you, you don't realize that it's really good work being done, but it does take time. And and rolling it out and seeing the successes will take time. And a lot of times, investment in economic development is short term. And then you get you get momentum happening, and and trying to find funding is. Is, is very difficult for an economic development function. And uh, trying to uh, demonstrate that you're making progress even though it's not visible at the time. That, that I wish I'd have known that ahead of time. So patient sounds like it's key. Yeah. I think in, in my case, I wish I'd known just how interested tons of young creative families actually are who are currently living in big cities and moving to a small place. It was fascinating listening to Terry because I think our, our listeners uh, tuning into this webinar can see that there's obviously a, a significant structural difference between a region like the region around Trail and a truly remote, small, individual municipality like Caslow uh, with no, no industrial advantage uh, like tech certainly represents, or a big ski resort like Red Mountain. So what we didn't fully appreciate, this is all good news, not bad news, what we do now in part because of some subsequent work the BC Rural Center has done with, with a fellow named Zachary Mannheimer, who's based in Iowa, who's probably the leading expert on how remote, truly remote, small communities can attract young urban creatives. We, we discovered that and, and have created actually a, a, a list of the top 13 reasons why young creative urban types will actually consider moving to a truly remote community like Caslow. And there are of course hundreds of truly remote small communities like Caslow across the province. Number one on the list, cultural amenities. Number two on the list, high speed internet. Number three on the list, Terry will appreciate this, an entrepreneurial culture. Number four on the list, restaurants and a critical mass of shops. And number five on the list, my personal favorite, microbreweries. <laughs> number six on the list, innovative housing. Notice that word, innovative, not necessarily solely affordable, but innovative housing. Number 13 on the list of 13 items. And remember, this is a list of items that are germane not to, not to a rural community like Trail and the area around it, but to a truly remote, small community like Caslow. Number 13, last on the list, jobs. The re reason is that the kinds of folks that we were attracting through Escape the City bring their jobs with them. But then item number two on the list has okay. to be present, high-speed internet. 
So now that we know that, we're much better positioned to, to help other small remote communities like Caslo fashion a campaign that's truly going to be effective. And if they lack some of those items on that list, help them make something happen on those fronts. Very interesting. And um, what what would you guys say? Both of you talked about your kind of your community's unique assets, whether it's cultural or industrial. Um, how how should communities go forward to identify what those assets are if they don't already know? I think our biggest sure. success was stakeholder engagement. So, and it wasn't just the business community. It was it was a broad. It was a broad range of stakeholder engagements and so engaging the private public sector as well as your uh, elected officials making sure you had a really um uh, robust people sitting around the table and just and and big box guying it and making sure that you list everything and then start to uh, pick at you know the low-hanging fruit ones that you can you know piggyback potentially and then pick on something that will be able to really move your community forward and in our case, the process was quite informal. Uh, this is a very small community of fewer than a thousand people. So almost everything that happens in a in a village the size of Caslow is informal. Uh, of just conversations at coffee shops, meeting with the village mayor and council, uh, meeting with the chamber and its board, and having having conversations over coffee about what what are the the singular unique assets that that identify Caslow and and what the community came up with were two things number one culture Caslow is and the region around Caslow the North Kootenai Lake region is home to a, an astonishing number of world-class writers musicians artists actors filmmakers this is the home of according to USA Today one of the world's 10 best places to listen to outdoor music, the Kaslow Jazz Festival. And the other asset that was identified is communications. Kaslow is home to a community-based fiber optic enabled ISP called Kaslow Infonet. It's the world's smallest fiber enabled community controlled ISP. So in this 127 year old building that I'm speaking from you to you from today, we have access to gigabyte community control bandwidth. So that combination in the case of Caslow uh, was identified as its greatest singular asset and its big differentiator, communicultural strengths. So we've started calling Caslow the communicultural capital of rural British Columbia and a branding campaign can be built around that. And now, from the BC Rural Center's perspective, we're taking that informal process that I just described in the case of Caslow and the Escape the City contest approach, and taking it to a more formal, structured place, um, launching asset-based community development initiatives, working collaboratively with communities in a more organized way to help them identify their singular assets. Great. Um, we just have one time for one more question. We had a question that came from the audience for Terry. How did the regional initiative come together? Is it common in rural regions? Is this common in rural regions? And how do we encourage our municipalities and districts to come together um, in the context of attraction and recruitment? So uh, the first part of the question was, how did uh, the Regional Economic Development Office come about in or terms how did of the regional initiative? I guess around Metal Tech Alley come together. Well, it started with a regional economic development office, right? So uh, all of the municipalities pay into our function. So the five municipalities I mentioned, as well as the area, uh, Kootenai Boundary Regional District areas A and B, and they all pay into the LCIC economic development, regional economic development function based on population and taxation. And so they have, and have no, and I'm governed by a board of business professionals with no stakeholders on the board. The, um, the board is absolutely driven by the business um, business sector in our region. And so that has allowed us some autonomy to be <clears throat> innovative and creative because as anybody knows that businesses do not see boundaries or borders. It's, you know, it's a global 
uh, reach. And so having an economic development function that was already a, um, a regional function, and then clustering all of our assets in the entire region to create a strategy that everybody could buy into, had to make sure that it was attached to something that everybody was dependent on. And everybody in our region, like Randy said, and like those results from Randy saying, technology and access to technology and broadband was imperative. And all of us are touched by both the metallurgical and the technology sectors. There is nobody in our region that is not tied to tech in one way or another. If they're doctors and nurses, that hospital is here because of tech. If they're um, service industries, they're here because they need to serve the residents that are working at tech. So um, finding a way for um, all everybody be tied to um, is imperative to be able to drive a brand on a, on, a, on a regional scale, for sure. Did that answer your question? What was the other part of it? It is how do we encourage our municipalities and districts to come together on economic development for revenue? Yeah. Yeah, and that, that's a really great question. I, um, from a rural perspective, and definitely not as small as Randy, but our municipalities recognized that nobody had a budget for an economic development officer. They tried to have an economic development office um, officer out of like the regional district or the city of Trail, and um, that didn't work. That didn't work because they didn't get buy-in from the surrounding communities because that individual was focused on the individual region that uh, or, or community that um, provided their income and, and employed them and they realized they couldn't afford to have have a specific economic development function but if they worked together collaboratively and if they all agreed to pay in a function collaboratively that they could collaboratively have an economic development officer to drive the entire region and in fact it was understanding that those other regions actually added value to our community. Not one of them really, they're all very different and that actually makes the region a much more attractive. You take a, uh, a region like Fruitvale, they have the most incredible rural properties and opportunities in rural, um, in our rural region. They, they service that. Montrose is this bedroom community that has incredible family housing and family uh, support. And, you know, Rosin has this, you know, medical professionals and entrepreneurial culture and um, Red Mountain uh, service workers. So they're all very, very different communities, but they all actually attribute to a greater, a greater um, um, asset as a whole. And so it, by having them pick one thing, it might not be an economic development office, that might be way too big, but what I would recommend is getting them in a room and picking a project that they all could pay into to, to do together and start that kind of trust and building relationship on a project that um, would be successful to all the communities and then lead into an economic development function. Awesome. I think we are just about out of time here. It's just about two minutes to 11. So thank you both so much for participating and sharing your stories with our group today. One other person had asked if, Randy, if you're able to share that list of assets to for young urban entrepreneurs. So is that posted somewhere on the rural site or? It is indeed. If, uh, if that person would like to get in touch with me, if anyone listening would like to get in touch with us, uh, my email is randy at bcruralcenter.org. I'd be delighted to hear from you and I'd be happy to send you that link, of course. Fantastic. Terry, T. Van Horn at metaltechalley.com. <laughs> Fantastic. So um, if you have a similar story that you, to either uh, what you heard today, we'd love to feature you in our uh, BC Idea, Ideas Exchange success stories. So you can do that by emailing us at economicdevelopment at gov.bc.ca or you can um, ask to be contacted in the survey that's going to come up um, in the next webinar. Um, uh, please, if you're not already, subscribe to our webinars. Please do that um, by following uh, the links on our website. We have an interesting webinar coming up next month, which is going to include, um, include information about uh, tariffs and tax uh, free trade agreements. A lot of people are looking to diversify their exports. So the, the folks from the um, International Trade Group will be sharing information about how to learn more about international trade.
Um, and then if you have any suggestions or any ideas for other webinars that you'd like to hear um, or topics that you'd like information on, please uh, let us know at that email that I mentioned earlier, economicdevelopment at gov.bc.ca. And uh, the webinar invitations are available if you want to share this with anyone who's interested in, our, in, our, uh, in, in these types of topics, but they're not already tuning in. That would be great. The short link is just www.cm.pn slash 3INJ. And you'll just include some information, including your job title and your organization, just so that we're aware of the people that we are chatting with. So that is all from us today. You'll receive a, a survey tomorrow, and we do appreciate that feedback so that that can tie into our future webinars. Um, and this recording will be posted on our past webinar site um, in the next week or so. So if you want to go back and catch some information that you might have missed or uh, you'd like to share it with anyone else, look on our website in about a week. Thank you all for joining in, and then a special thanks to Tara, Terry and Randy uh, for sharing their information with the group. Thanks, Bye. Jessica. Thanks, everyone. Bye.